Colossians chapter 3. If I'm just being honest with you, I could go on singing for a while. And uh, this is unfortunate, but ever since COVID, it hurts a little bit. I don't like that, but I'll get over it. And uh, it's worth it is how I feel about it. And so uh, anyway, I, I love singing, period. But I love singing these songs. It, uh, it's good for the soul. It, it really, really is. As a matter of fact, one might actually be able to say that singing is something that really matters. That singing really matters. And God helping us for the next uh, several Sunday nights, we're going to talk about that uh, during this month of November that singing really matters. It matters to God. And because there's a lot of passages that I've studied and developed and am excited about preaching, but I don't know if I'll get to preach them all and, and that sort of thing, uh, let me just put some things on your mind that you can think about or you can go read and, and dwell on. They'll be a blessing to you. Think back to Matthew chapter 26. After Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and then the Bible just gives this detail. And after they had sung a hymn, they went, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, this is something that I hadn't considered until very recently when I was studying for this. But what must it have been like to sing with Jesus? I mean, think about that for just a second. I'd never had these thoughts go through my mind before, but I thought when I, when I was looking at that passage and, and studying that out, I actually thought about this. Was he a bass, a baritone, a tenor? Was he all of them? I mean, he is the son of God. He might have, been a, he, he might have had a really wide range. I, I don't know. But did he sing harmony? Did he sing the melody? Uh, and, and we know that the Bible makes a distinction between psalms and hymns, so I, I want to know what they sang. They didn't sing, uh, they, I'm pretty sure they didn't sing a psalm from the Old Testament. The Bible says that they sung a hymn, so I, I don't know what that was. I mean, we could guess, but most of the hymns we sing weren't written B.C. So, uh, or, or D.C., which is during Christ. Uh, so I don't know exactly, that's my own terminology. Uh, I, I, so I don't know exactly what they sing, but I want to know. One of these days I can ask and I can find out. But what must that have been like to sing with the Son of God? And, not, and understand this, um, I mean it just sounds like I'm going to go ahead and preach that one and get it out of the way, but... but Think about the circumstances in which they are singing together. I mean, Jesus has just said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood which is shed for you. And he has set up his own memorial service to be instituted until he comes back again. And he's done that with his disciples and he started that whole discussion in John chapter 13 um, by saying, I'm going away from you and where I'm going, ye cannot come. And we just went through John and, and maybe you're remembering this right now. But he has foretold them about his death and that it would be very soon. Little do they know that as they're singing this hymn, as they go to the Mount of Olives, that there Jesus is going to be arrested taken into custody. And there's going to be a very great temptation that very night to lose their song. Does anybody know what it's like to lose your song? To be tempted to, to lose your song? To lose your either your song or your reason for singing and just feel like, look, I, I can't sing. There's, there's nothing I have to sing about. 
If you go back to the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 137, you'll find that the children of Israel got to that point. The, the children of Israel, when they were taken captive and they were carried out of their land and, and now they're, they're, they're set up in a, in a colony, if you will, at, around a foreign river in a foreign country, to them it would have been defiled Gentile territory. They said, we have nothing to sing about. How can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? Well, guess what tonight? We're in a strange land. Sing about it on Wednesday night. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We are, uh, the book of Hebrews talks about this. We are strangers and we are pilgrims. And as such, we confess that we seek a different country. We seek a country whose builder and maker is God. And it would be easy for us to be tempted tonight to say, how do we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? And let's be very realistic. The land that we live in is, it, it very well could uh, progressively look stranger and stranger to the child of God. And we know that it will because evil seducers shall wax worse and worse. We know that. It's in the Bible. Let me encourage you tonight. Our singing is not based upon what land we dwell in. Our singing is done and has always been done by pilgrims and strangers in a foreign country. Because our, song, our, songs, uh, our songs, let me get the word out, our songs don't come from our circumstances. Listen to what Paul writes to the Colossians as an encouragement to them in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Do y'all see where our songs come from? Our songs are a direct product of God's word dwelling richly in our life. In other words, the more productive God's word is in our life, the more reason we have to sing. The more of God's wisdom that is applied in our life, and I'm, I'm going to borrow from James here, and I'm going to say not the wisdom which is of the world, which is earthy, but the wisdom which is from above. The more that wisdom is applied in our life, the more reason we have to sing. Because guess what? God's word is rich no matter where we live. God's word is rich no matter what our circumstances are going on. God's word is rich no matter what's going on in our life. And God's wisdom works in every situation. Because of that, we have every reason to sing. As a matter of fact, the encouragement here is not just to sing, but that singing should fill a particular purpose. And that is that Singing is not just for yourself. Now, we're going to talk about this in a minute because I definitely believe that singing has some personal benefits, but singing is not just for yourself. We sing for one another. We sing because we, we need to hear that from each other. And that's why he says teaching and admonishing one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. This is one of the reasons that I believe, and God helping me as long as I'm pastor, I always will believe, that the songs we sing have to say something. Because it's not just about making a melody or a harmony or it's sounding good or it's sounding pretty or it being professional. It's about saying something. It's about learning something. It's about being taught something or admonished from the words that we sing. You ever learn something about God from a song? Now look, songs aren't inspired like this word is inspired. But there are songs 
that are inspired by this word. And when they line up with the word of God, they can feed the soul just like the Bible does. I'm not saying that, that, that um, they are inerrant. As a matter of fact, there's songs in this book right here. We, we use this book right here, this Rejoice Hymnal. We use this, but there are songs with gross doctrinal errors in this book. That's why we don't sing every song in this book. We pick and choose. And by the way, when we were picking a hymnal, we looked at, how many did we look at, Brother Flint? I'd say well over 20 at least. And we couldn't find any of them that were just perfectly South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church. Because I've said this a bunch of times. My kids, I've even heard repeat this. True theology ruins a lot of good songs. It really does. Right doctrine ruins a lot of otherwise good songs. Boy, I really like the tune of that song. Well, the tune of that song doesn't make it singable if the words aren't true. And there's, there's songs that, that were written by people that didn't believe like we believe and they, they, they uh, parrot their beliefs and things like that. But look, we want songs that teach what this Bible teaches. We want songs that admonish like the Bible admonishes. And I'm, th I'm thankful for good godly songs that, that, that echo deep down in our soul so that whenever we need it, that God can take a song and he can put it in our heart and it can even come out through our mouth and we're reminded that God is true and God is faithful. And I can, I can think of a host of times throughout my life that I've been facing some situation and there's, a, there's, there's a, so many times that God, the, the Holy Spirit of God has brought scripture to mind, but there's other times where God has put just that right song in my mind and there I am singing it and thinking about the words and thinking there's my answer right there. And it comes in a song. Because God knows the value of singing. And while it's important that we sing songs that say something and we sing songs that, that teach and admonish the truth, let me tell you something. The, the message of the song is not the only thing that teaches and admonishes. Sometimes it's just the singing itself. I want to say that again. Sometimes it's just the singing itself. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I've lost my song. By the way, one of the greatest musicians in my mind that ever lived, King David, there were times he lost his song. There were times he prayed and said, Lord, return unto me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, give me a reason to sing again because I'm telling you, sin will mess up the ability to sing. Sin will rob you of a reason to sing. And it, it creates chaos and confusion. It steals, it robs us of joy and peace in our lives. But there's been times when I haven't had my song, but I've heard somebody else singing. And maybe at first my mind went to this, what are they singing about? Or what reason do they have to sing? But their singing reminded me that I have a reason to sing too. And I'm talking about regardless of what they were singing, it, their singing, uh, their mirth, if I could use a biblical word, their, their happiness, their joy, and, and how that joy manifests itself by song was a, was a token to me that I do have a reason to sing. And I can sing. And when I say I can sing, I'm not talking about my talent or my ability and you're going to hear this a couple times, uh, God willing, over these next uh, Sunday nights, but I'm, I'm going to ask you politely and yet boldly, get the idea out of your mind that you can't sing. Maybe there's somebody in here, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, but, but maybe there's somebody in here who would raise their hand and say, Preacher, I have had people tell me you really shouldn't sing around other people. Maybe that should be a hobby when you're by yourself. 
Well, let me set the record straight. Get rid of that notion. Because I don't care what you sound like. I don't care if you're tone deaf. And quite honestly, neither does God. God made you the way he wanted you made. And he did not suggest that we sing. We're going to see this from the Bible. He didn't suggest that you sing. He commands his children to sing. You don't want to be disobedient to God. Well, I don't know, preacher. It's not that I want to be disobedient to God, but maybe the people in front of me want me to disobey God. Well, I'm telling you right now, don't worry about the people in front of you. They probably need to move up closer to the front anyway. So you just keep singing out and maybe they will. And if their heart's like that, they need to be closer to the altar. Everybody can agree. You know, I can just picture this in a church where, uh, you know, somebody takes the counsel of God's word and they just commit. They're going to sing out and three services later, they have one whole side of the church to themselves. Now, I don't see that happening in this church because I have heard some people that could not carry tunes very well. But I'm going to tell you right now, there's... In this place, there's enough grace and there's enough love to deal with that. And because God's worthy, go ahead and sing out. Because I'm telling you right now, according to God's word, you need to sing and other people need to hear you sing. Now, this isn't a rebuke. I think you sang out well tonight. I, I have been a song leader and I enjoy leading singing and so I'm, I'm, a th I'm perfectly drawn to the conclusion that everybody can always sing out more. And I'm actively trying to draw more out of the congregation. And that's not an indictment to the, the fact that you're not singing, but everybody's got another gear. Even people that sing louder than everybody in the church. And you know who I'm talking about. Believe me, they've got another gear. And I'm just going to tell you, God's worthy. Now, I believe it should be melodic. You know, sometimes we get in here in vacation Bible school and we sing, but it's not melodic. It's It's yelling. It's screaming. And uh, one thing I always appreciate is we have those fun songs that we do, and they, they have their place. But I, I always have believed, and I still do, when we're getting down, when we're going to get into the message, then we need to settle in and we need to sing melodic. And uh, because it's not just, you know, scream as loud as you can and bust everybody's eardrums. Because what happens is you can get so loud that you lose diction. What do I mean by diction? Well, people can't understand what you're saying. And when we get to 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to talk about that because people need to be able to understand what you're singing. That itself is an indictment against what goes on as worship in a lot of churches today where you can't even understand what they're singing. But you need to sing melodically, even that singing, Paul says, need to, needs to be decently, uh, done decently and in order. There is, a, there is a cadence to music. There's some necessary things about music that need to be in there that God, God created into music. And we need to understand those things. But, I, but, but here's why I'm preaching tonight. We're going to get to all that stuff. But what I'm preaching tonight is that, listen, God commands us to sing. And we need to sing. We, uh, when we first started putting our services online uh, back in March, you remember 20 years ago back in March? Uh, but back in March when we started putting our services online, boy, those were fun days. I, I, those were just fun. Recording our services with a DSLR camera in 10-minute shifts, and uh, then 
Brother Zach editing them together, and, and some of you will remember this. We, we did full song services, special music, preaching, and, and things like that. And, and we love that. And honestly, that would still be my preference. I wish we could still do that. But in order to upload our services in a timely manner, and uh, especially with the uh, very weak internet signal that we have here at church, and uh, which hopefully is going to be corrected soon, trust in the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, we just, we cannot live stream, and, and we have to take it off site and upload it. And if any, anybody knows anything about uploading, video is large files, and so we basically just had to, for this time, condense it down to the preaching service and, and upload it to YouTube. But I can't tell you how many times since we've just been uploading the messages to YouTube that I've talked with people who are choosing not to get out and come to services right now, and especially uh, people that would uh, be, be considered at high risk with the infection of this virus. And they've said to me, Preacher, we watch every service, and this is what we do. We've got a hymn book, and we pick out some songs, and before we hit play on the message, we sing some songs. You know what? Man, that blesses my heart. That encourages me. You know why? Because we didn't cut the song service out of our videos because it's not necessary, because it's not needed. Uh, we, we cut that out so that we could try to expedite things and get the preaching out there to people in, in a timely fashion. And I hope to eventually go back to including everybody in our song services here. And we just don't have that capability right at this moment. But it blessed my heart to hear people saying, hey, pastor, we're still singing. Now, they, they might have gotten so used to picking out their own songs that they're not going to like the ones Brother John picks out now. And I'm teasing about that. But man, that's, that's a blessing to my heart. You know why? Because we don't sing at this church as a signal for everybody to come in here and have a seat to get ready for the preaching. That's not why we do that. I've visited and I've been in churches where uh, you know, halfway through the first song and sometimes maybe halfway through the second song. People are still coming in and, and people are still fellowshipping and people are talking and the song service is going on. Everything's just going on like, uh, like this is normal. I'm going to tell you, that's not what we're doing here. Th this, isn't, this isn't, hey, get ready for the preaching time. The singing is important in and of itself. The singing carries messages all by itself, messages that we need to hear. Guess what? You can not like your preacher and still get spoken to out of the song service. So you don't, you don't have any excuse because God wants to actively work in our hearts corporately from the moment our service begins. And, and I make no apology about how our service normally begins is this. We sing. We sing to the Lord. We, we try to, I, I encourage you this all the time, we try to get everything else off our mind and we try to dismiss all of the distractions around us and let's get our minds on the Lord. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to sing. And then during that time, we also pray. And we're not praying so that you have, uh, have opportunity to fill out your offering envelope that you forgot to do. That's not why we pause for prayer right there. No, we pause for prayer because we want to talk to God. We want to invite his presence in our service. We want him to accept our worship and our praise that we came to offer him. And so we sing. I'll tell you another reason why we sing. God's done this in my heart so many times. We sing so that when we leave here, we have songs that are fresh on our mind and fresh on our heart that hopefully will help carry us as we go through the week. 
You say, well, I don't know. Song leader throws a new one in there every now and then. Yeah, but he's thrown some catchy new ones in there. And I'm not talking about catchy like... I'm talking about there was something about that that just stuck in my spirit. And then later in the week, something comes along and God brings that song back to my mind. And, and, and listen, some of them are the old songs of Zion that we've been singing forever and ever and ever. And God's still using them in our heart and he's still using them in our life. And sometimes I have to come in here and take one of these hymn books and go, now what did that thing say? And I go back and I read the words again. And I said, yeah, that's what I thought it said. And man, I needed that. And then guess what happens? He keeps leading those new songs, and pretty soon those new songs aren't new songs anymore. They're old songs. And there's nothing wrong with new ones. I'll just go on record as saying right now, there is nothing wrong with new songs being written today. Some people act like, well, I'll tell you what, if, bless God, if it wasn't written 1944 before, we're not singing it. Because God, God quit helping people write songs somewhere probably back around the 1800s. That's not true. There's still some songs that are good and they're new. Now, you've got to be careful because a lot of the new songs are junk. They're garbage and they're a lot more tuned to the satisfaction of the flesh than they are the Spirit of God. And we want to be careful about that. We want to be watchful about that. But there's some new songs that are a blessing. There's some new songs that are good. You know, I'm not going to get in tonight. He says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And somebody might be asking tonight, what's the, what's the breakdown about that? What's, what is he talking about psalms? What is he talking about hymns? What is he talking about spiritual songs? And I, I'm not going to do that. I encourage you to go. Do the word studies, search that out yourself. But I, I am going to just say this. Jesus taught in John chapter 4 that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And any song that's not conducive to the working of the ministry of the Spirit of God has no place in a corporate worship service. And probably doesn't have place in the life of, of a believer, of a child of God. You know, um, I know how much I know how much y'all love science. You know, like real science. So that's why I bring it into a message every now and then. And this isn't this isn't by any means scripture, so uh, you can take this for what it is. But every now and then, I like looking into this kind of stuff. Um, and, and I'll, be on, I'll be very honest with you about why, I'm looking, why I looked into this this time. Because recently I had a phone conversation with uh, Miss Doreen Martin. She's sitting back here and she's about to have surgery again. We're praying for her about that. But she's been in a lot of pain. This is what Miss Doreen said to me on the phone here a while back. She said, Preacher, I've been going through a lot of pain. But you know what I do during those times? I sing. And it helps. And I thought, well, I know there's something to that. As a matter of fact, we're, we might, if, if God will allow us, we might look at a passage of Scripture that talks about that if anybody's, if anybody's sick, if anybody's hurting, anybody's going through a rough time, he talks about let him sing songs. So we know biblically that it's very possible that singing could help. And, you know, I hate false science. I hate stuff that's called science, but all it really is is agenda. And there's a lot of that around today. As a matter of fact, the entire evolutionary theory is not science at all. It's agenda. It's more religion than it is science. And it actually takes more faith. <laughs> but I like real science because real science validates the truth of the Word of God. And so here's what I found out. I found out that 
this was published in the Journal of Music Therapy in 2004. It said this, that when a person sings, they have found medically that endorphins are released in the brain. And these endorphins have uh, several different um, uh, functions uh, in, in, the, uh, in the body. One of them is that it actually acts as a pain reliever to people, uh, uh, to people that deal with chronic pain. So singing can actually help physically to deal with pain. I'm telling you, if people knew the Word of God, it'd be interesting to walk over here to Mercy Hospital tonight and go in the emergency room, and it'd sound like a choir. Wouldn't that be something? That doctors came in and said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some tests, and I'm going to go have to read them and things like that. It's going to take a little bit, but, but here's a songbook. Why don't you sing a little bit while I'm gone? But I'm telling you, this is science. That when you sing, the brain produces this chemical that helps to deal with pain. See, even science agrees with Miss Doreen that this actually works. This is what this study found. This is this was pretty interesting to me. It found that this is especially true when we sing with other people. Like as in congregational singing. Some of you didn't know that we're fighting diseases in here. We're, we're a hospital in here. I'm telling you right now, you can come in here and feel better. And the Bible already tells you that, so you should already know it. But if you had any wondering, well, science backs up the Bible. That if you want to feel better, you ought to come to church and get with a congregation of people and sing. This is what it said. It said that group singing induces the production of oxytocin, which is considered a bonding hormone. It's a hormone produced in the body that causes bonding amongst a group of people. This is what singing does. It's almost like God created it this way. And knew that when he instituted his church and told them to sing together. Group singing induces the production of oxytocin, the bonding hormone. This hormone can reduce stress, anxiety, and increase feelings of trust and well-being. Now, now listen, here's what I'm going to ask you not to do tonight. Don't walk out of here believing me because of the science when you weren't believing me because of the Bible. I'm just telling you that when I researched it and I looked into it, here's what I found. I found science that, was, that didn't know it, but science that was willing to say, that agrees with the Bible. That you can come to church and you can sing together as a group and, and you can experience the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace and it can help you with your stress. It can help you with your anxiety. It can help you with feelings of trust and well-being. And who doesn't, who doesn't appreciate that? God told us all of this before science ever thought to look into it. I'll tell you, and I'm almost done, but I, I want to point this out. There were generations gone by when almost every vocalist or musician that made it in the music industry started at church. I could give you some names if you wanted them. Even the king. And I use that term very loosely. But I'm talking about Elvis Presley. Elvis wasn't bashful about saying that he got his beginning in church. 
long before Jailhouse Rock, he was singing Peace in the Valley and How Great Thou Art. Now, I want to tell you, people make their own decisions and they go their own way. And his decision and the decision of many, many others. I, I, I remember, uh, just real quick, I remember one time sitting in my aunt's house and she had, uh, she had this uh, rack of magazines there and I was just looking through there and there was good housekeeping and all these types of things. And there was just a, there was like a uh, interior decorating magazine or something there, but it had a, had a lodge look on the cover and, you know, that lodge look with moose and elk and stuff that got my attention and I picked it up and I was flipping through this magazine and lo and behold in this magazine I don't know how it got in there but there was an article in there about Britney Spears and here's what the article uh, pointed out that Britney Spears as a child grew up in a Baptist church now look I'm not making an indictment against the Baptist church where Britney Spears grew up because everybody makes their own decisions and goes their own way. But I'm just saying this, there were generations of people that learned to sing in congregations like this one right here. And in choir life, choir lofts like this one up here. And kids groups and choirs like the one that just sang here during the revival meeting. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. It's pretty sad, actually, but there's been a major shift in music in that a lot of the musicians that are making it big today, they've never been in a church. And they're learning music from the world. And their life emulates it. But the world didn't create music. God did. And if anybody ought to be singing, it's God's people. And what do we sing about? Well, not like the world. We're not singing about all the woes and miseries of life. The songs that we sing that mention the woes and miseries of life are only to draw our attention upward to the hope that we have in God. I'm just telling you, the world stole music from God. They don't own it. And if anybody ought to be singing, it's God's people. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you sense yourself drifting away from fellowship with God, get back to reading God's Word and let God's Word richly put a song back in your heart again. And when that song comes back in your heart from the richness of God's word, sing. Sing with grace in your hearts and sing to the Lord. That's what he's asked us to do. I'm not kidding. It'll brighten your day. It'll cheer your life. It will remind you, and we all need to be reminded right now, it will remind you, God is good. God is faithful. It might remind you something like this. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He never fails. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. I just got a feeling I might be singing that a little bit in the week ahead. I might be singing over the next few days, my anchor holds, or 
We have an anchor that keeps the soul. Because I need those songs. And you need those songs. And you, I'm talking to you. You need to sing. You need to sing. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word.